The following is a conversation with Dr. Subhash Kak. Dr. Kak is the Regents Professor of Computer Science at Oklahoma State University, Stillwater. He is also a theoretical physicist, a historian, a linguist, a philosopher, and a poet, among other things. He is a recipient of India's fourth highest civilian award, the Padma Shri. Dr. Kak has authored a number of books, including The Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda, The Nature of Physical Reality, Mind and Self, The Architecture of Knowledge and Computation in Ancient India. In this conversation, we spoke about various topics related to ancient Indian history. Now, this was filmed a few months ago, by the way, back in February. I just saved it until now. I wanted to get this channel going properly before releasing this video. Enjoy the conversation. Okay, it's recording now. So let me begin with the first question. So Dr. Kak, you have written a number of books and papers on Indian history, ancient Indian science, philosophy, and, and much more. So how did you as a scientist become interested in history? Well, um, what happened more than um, more than 30 years ago, 35 years ago or so, was that I was doing AI. And then I remembered that my father, when I was a kid, used to tell me about uh, this great genius from India named Panini, who had been able to represent the grammar of Sanskrit in 4,000 rules. And of course, I didn't know anything about, about Panini. I had not studied Sanskrit formally. I had studied, I'd done Sanskrit at home because my father was a scholar, uh, but never studied it, never studied grammar. In fact, I haven't studied any grammar, not even English grammar or Hindi grammar. You know, you just uh, internalize the rules. That's how I've learned most languages. So that got me thinking, okay, if Panani did this uh, at least 2,500 years ago, according to the most conservative uh, chronologies, there must have been a history of corresponding intellectual work prior to that. So I started uh, looking up uh, history books and I was astounded because most standard history books said that there was no writing at the time of Panani and writing came much later with the Greeks. Now here is a system which is so intricate, you know, it's like a mathematical program. And in fact, um, a lot of scholars have said that what Panani did was equivalent to a universal Turing machine because a grammar can create an infinity of uh, sentences, right? And that's what he did. An abstract system with rules and meta rules, which is what you have in a computer program. So there should have been a history. And of course, Panani himself says that there were gra grammarians before him. So this got me thinking that there must be something wrong with the standard accounts. So let me investigate uh, the literature. This was the mid 80s. So I started with the, the, the sutras, the, the, the various siddhantas. I looked up astronomy books. Then I went back, did the Puranas, the, the, the Upanishads, the Aranyakas, the Brahmanas, and then of course the Sanghitas, the actual Vedic um, uh, books. And um, while doing this in stages, of course, the more I investigated, first I discovered that nobody had looked at these books for a hundred years. Ever since um, British uh, translators, uh, about 1900 or so, uh, announced that these books were full of stupidity, you know, especially um, the Brahmanas. They said it's all stupidity. This is the worst the human mind can descend to, worst levels. So doing Shatapata Brahmana, which is one of the biggest books, biggest Brahmanas that there is, I discovered chapters on, um, on, uh, on astronomy. And that got me going. And I spent a few years uh, studying those chapters. And I wrote a lot of book, a lot of research papers, both in Western journals and Indian journals on astronomy and from there I discovered an astronomical code of the Rig Veda. I wrote a book on that and uh, and then that got me thinking about other things also that well you also have the Indo-European language family what are the possible connections and wherever I looked I was not persuaded by the standard paradigm that this could not be true and especially the idea 
you know, I have no problem with people moving, and I have no problem with with uh, uh, with the idea that maybe we we are Europeans or whatever. You know, whatever it doesn't really matter because all humanity is one. And as the Vedas say, within every body is the same Purush. So all human beings are the same. The Vedic system is a universal system. So so this whole thing about race based historiography that I discovered, I found repulsive and abhorrent and not based on facts. If it was true, fine, you know, you say that this is what it is. And why, what is the one big uh, data point which stands out? Well, look, you, you, you do archaeology of India, you know, Harappan era and prior to that, which goes back to six, 7,000 BC. And you find when you do studies, uh, comparative archaeology, that India was the most densely populated region of the ancient world. All right, so fine. Uh, you have all these Harappan towns and settlements, thousands of them. Now, the theory is that um, some people on horseback, maybe even without their wives, uh, came down because they had chariots or whatever, and then they conquered it. Okay, good theory, but does it stand up to facts? Well, if they came down and they conquered it, they would lose their language in one uh, generation or two, right? Even if they forced their women folk, they abducted uh, from the plains of India, well, they will not be able to uh, keep that language alive, right? Or if they came in groups, then they would be they would be living in um, in uh, enclaves, and uh, so their language would be different from that of others. But in any event, you have no um, no memory of any place names which are not Sanskritic in all of India, and you find cultural continuity from the Harappan era to the later period. And then I also worked on the Indus script and I found, I'm quite convinced, and there are lots of other people who agree with that, that uh, the Brahmi script, which goes back to about 500 BCE, uh, structurally, you know, without claiming to have deciphered the, the Indus script, is similar. And in fact, the argument there is that the 10 most commonly occurring uh, Indus signs are literally identical to the 10 most uh, Brahmi signs based on frequencies, because for Brahmi, we have frequencies of Sanskrit, right? So, so the argument is that people came down, they could not have imposed their language on all of India. So therefore, this model is wrong, right? And if this model is wrong, what could be right? So you look at the text um, and you find uh, that the earliest texts do not have any knowledge of any region excepting North India, Northwest India, especially the Sapta Sindhu era. And then the later ones like Aitreya Brahman, right? It talks about Bhalik, just above the, beyond the Himalayas. And the further down in the uh, literary layers that we have India, from India, from the Itihasas, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, there's also reference to trans Himalayan region that people went across that Arjuna went across the Himalayas. They went to Uttar Kuru. And now uh, across the Himalayas, Uttar Kuru finally represents Central Asia. And even Ptolemy, when he wrote his geography, he called it Uttar Kuru. The languages of Uttar Kuru until 1000 CE were Sanskritic because we have huge history of Khotan. You know, Khotan was conquered by the Islamic Turks in 1006 CE. And before Khotan, which is Central Asia, Khotan collapsed. And beyond Central Asia, you had other states like, you know, Tokharian, uh, where Tokharian language, which is also an Indo-European uh, language. Um, so, so it was a what one might call Sanskritic, where I'm using Sanskritic in a rather general sense. So, but the languages of Khotan were indeed Sanskritic. One of the languages that was spoken and used there very greatly uh, was what's been called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. It was Sanskrit without all the Paninian rules, right? So it was not orthodox, uh, orthodox grammar. And then you had um, Khotanese language. Then you also had Gandhari, which is a North Indian, um, you know, middle Indo-Aryan language. 
All right. So if you have Indian literature, which speaks of this central region, which is Aryavart or you know Northwest India or North India, including Gujarat. But I'm very pleased to tell you that because you are from Gujarat. The Gujarat yes. was the heartland of the Harappan region, you know. Yes, it was. Yeah. So, so if that is what the case is, and later literature starts talking about regions beyond the Himalayas, and then you have the Puranas, which speaks about the five people, the five Janas um, of the earlier Vedic period, and then the Anus went go west, and the Druyus go northwest because there is this. Um, Dasha Ragnya War, you know, the Ten uh, Kings War, which is uh, mentioned in the Rig Veda. And, and then you have, um, then you have, then you go uh, further beyond. And I've looked at uh, Kotanis, everybody except all the linguists know that it's Indo Aryan, uh, the other languages in Kotan. But uh, the Western region, which is Sogdian, which goes all the way to Caspian, there the language has generally been called Iranian. But Iranian, really, this dichotomy between Iranian and Aryan is a false one. Why? It is. Because the earliest Iranian language is Avesta, right? The language of Avesta. Avesta is much further down chronologically than the Rig Veda. Not just the astronomical um, evidence, but also linguistic evidence. And if scholars admit, and they all agree on this, that the Avesta language is almost identical to late Vedic, then Avesta or Iranian should be seen as a branching uh, language, you know, beyond the earliest Rig Vedic. You know, you just have to use common sense. You have to stand up. And this is what I thought. I was like the boy who said that the emperor had no clothes because, <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to be in, in scholarly work. You just stand up if your system is all sound and you want it to be sound. You don't want to hold on to opinions just because they make you feel good. Because after all, what each one of us is after is the truth, right? Okay, so you have uh, you have all these languages. Uh, well, I was talking about Sogdian. So I, uh, I've been looking at Sogdian for the past two, three years. I've been looking at uh, the vocabulary, and I find so many Sanskrit, uh, um, you know, similarities in structure itself. And then that made me go beyond Sogdia because Sogdia, the Sogdians were the intermediaries between Uttar Kuru or a part of Uttar Kuru also and of course the Shakas, all of these people are called Shakas, but the Shakas themselves claim to be speaking Aryan languages. You know about 30-40 years ago um, this inscription of Karnishka was discovered called the Rabatak uh, inscription in Afghanistan where Kanishka proclaims that I who speaks the Aryan language, right? So beyond the Sogdians uh, is um, is um, the Russian steppes and Ukrainian steppes and um, the Slav people who inhabit half of Europe. And you study their texts before they were Christianized rather recently, about a thousand years ago, or even, even sooner because the rural folks in Russia held on to their earlier religion until about 1600. And even after that, they practice what has been called doveri. Veri is like pari, truth, you know, para. Doveri is two truths, that they have one formal religion, they go to church, but at homes, they have their own old system, which is why you see that the Russian spirit, you know, with a sense of suffering, which you see in the great Russian novels of Dostoevsky or Tolstoy and 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 Chekhov and everybody else, they it's it's communicating that you know that violent separation that they suffered from their traditions, where their religion, which I can see as you know, I, the more I analyze it, really the same as the Vedic religion, you know, with the same divinities. The main divinity was uh, Parjanya, which they called Parkonas, right? And then they worshiped, they represented their divinities in multiple, with multiple faces, which is what, which is a hallmark of uh, the Vedas, right? Multiple uh, faces because the truth is inexpressible. But when you use language and concepts, then then it gets faces, right? And uh, 
and then you represent these faces uh, in homology with directions or with, with you know past present and the future so you have triplicate gods or gods with four faces now the main god of the slavic world was triglav which is tri tribhaga three gods bhaga bhagavan god god in the slavic world is bhaga right bhagavan which is the same as in india uh, or shvetavit the great god with four faces in the slavic world was shvetavit they call it shvetavit which is sanskrit and what are the four faces the north one is swarag swarga they call it swarga swarga, swarga. <clears throat> the west one is parjanya the south one is lada which is ladaha which is another name for earth in sanskrit and the east one is um, is um, is moksha because you look at surya surya represents the heavens as in the vedas you know you have um, bhu bhuva swaha swar is this sun uh, which represents the heavens and it's of course really the heavens within uh, within each and which is where i must tell you this one of the most astonishing discovery that i made in the early 90s was uh, this part of um, of um, vedic astronomy the meaning of the of the number 108 because the vedic rishis had discovered that the sun was 108 times sun's diameter and the moon was 108 times moon's diameter away from the earth and therefore the inner sun is symbolically 108 times its names that's why we we or one of the sadhanas could be uh, chanting the name of the divinity 108 times right and then um, even as a dancer as an artist because that's another sadhana in bharatanatyam you have 108 karanas 108 poses of shiva right so you find this amazing connections and you find some of these intimations also elsewhere in the slavic world the the druids the Celts, even the romans because there were connections not just overland but also by sea um, you find all these connections but not with all the understanding as if some of these things were carried through cultural interactions both towards the west and these were you know anonymous people like you and i in these times these were people who went with their knowledge and their knowledge was so powerful and beautiful for them to be shared with everybody just as anonymous people went to southeast and went to japan which still uses the sanskritic or brahmic uh, siddham script you know of a of 1500 years ago they went to china went everywhere because this is what we believe this is not what the european colonialist scholars told us that your knowledge is sectarian you're not and totally false so for me it's been the most astonishing discovery a uh, discovery that here for 150 years indians have fallen into this strange coma believing things which are totally false about their own civilization they've been separated just as the slavs were violently separated from their past or just as the nord the nordics even the germanic people were violently separated when they were christianized or even the romans themselves were violently separated the greeks were violently separated so have indians been violent not violently more subtly separated mr macaulay and his successors and some of them were wonderful people some of the english scholars were great you know like colebrook and many many others some of the recent European scholars have been great. People have done quantum mechanics like Schrodinger and others. They've been connected to the Vedic tradition. And they have proclaimed that indeed this is what we are talking about. You know, this is Schrodinger says that in his autobiography, uh, that this is the source of universal knowledge, which belongs to every human being. But okay, so the the English say there's some wonderful people amongst them. And they did uh, great stuff in safeguarding this and uh, producing uh, texts and so on or doing lexical work. But 
from the perspective of power, the ones who were projecting projecting power or using it to control India, because this was the source of the great wealth of the English empire, they fostered these false ideas on the Indians. And it's very, very sad that a lot of Indians have internalized them, that Indians are separated from this past. And Indians believe, a lot of the westernized Indians believe in things which are not true. If they were true, then we should accept it. You know, we ultimately, the judge is the Sakshi within us, the witness within us who is detached, who is truthful, right? So what we are holding on to is false. It doesn't stand the test of scrutiny. And so ultimately what I've discovered, you know, your question was about how I got into history. It ultimately turned out to be much more than just history, that it's something about the very existential issues related to India, related to Indian culture, Indian sciences. We cannot truly be vital. We cannot truly contribute in a vital sense to all of humanity's concerns and challenges until we get reconnected to this astonishing tradition, which is alive, which is going to be of value even in the future, because this tradition ultimately is about the mystery of consciousness. You know, you have the physical reality, then you have consciousness that like two sides of the coin, right? And materiality is good. We must also investigate that. That's what standard sciences do. But then the other side is the mystery, which uh, Western science has not been able to address, which is why Western science is facing a huge crisis. So all everything has come together. So for me, my scientific work uh, has become uh, a part of my historical research, researches, or you could put it the other way around. Right. So in my case, I got interested in history because I wanted to understand the origins of my surname and, and uh, the people of the region where I belong to. So that's how I got interested into his, in history. And what I discovered was that the world doesn't exist in silos. Civilizations don't exist in silos. They're all interconnected. The more you discover history, the more you find the interconnections between the various civilizations. Now, you spoke about the fact that India has... Uh, the people of India have internalized all these falsehoods about their history. I would say that the same thing exists for Europe because the, the entire European continent has witnessed this immense holocaust. The Indo-European culture has been stamped out over a period of, let's say, a thousand years. And they don't know about this. They don't even know their own history. For example, uh, there was this uh, Roman... There was this Germanic warrior called Arminius who resisted the Romans and he defeated a Roman army in about 13 CE. That's about 2007 years ago. <coughs> now, now, in the year 2007 or 13, it was the 2000th anniversary of this. And nobody in Germany celebrated this because they don't know their history. So this is another example of that. And we find that, that if you look at our Indian history textbooks, there is absolutely nothing about it seems like there is no indian history before 2000 before around 500 bce so why do you think it is this way is it that they have uh, they have neglected our itihasas do they consider our itihasas to be myth and don't take it seriously is that the reason why it is like this well well uh, first uh, i would um, not totally agree with uh, what you said about uh, europe what you said was true until, say, three, four hundred years ago, um, until the Renaissance began, which is when Europe discovered its Greek past. Or prior to that, you know, the Dark Ages. They were totally separated. And I think India is partly in that Dark Age phase. So after that, Europe's expansion start began when they got connected, at least science arose, you know, the scientific revolution, although then there was another horrific uh, side to European history, which was uh, the genocides that were perpetrated, you know, with their um, economic power as they went into the Americas and so on. 
so there is that element but and and but there's also much more openness to the past now, they may not be aware of it but they want to be aware of it you know maybe 50 60 percent of the people in fact when i travel in europe or in the us i find much more openness um, of course even even in india, in, in india people are tremendously open they want to know all this in india the problem is mostly the anglicized world controlled by the official books ncert books and other books because one of the tragedies that occurred in india was in the mid 70s when mrs gandhi gave control of all intellectual enterprises and university uh, administration to the communists and then they imposed their their view but now the problem, now that is one of the problems. The other problem is that partly because of this and partly because education has been controlled, we don't have a very vital uh, uh, tradition of critical research within India. And we need that because now, of course, you said, well, why do we go back only to 500 BCE in Indian history books? Because the argument there is that um, unless there is confirmation by other um, writers, you know, maybe outside writers. So you go back only to, um, to the Greeks. So India is sort of born with the Greeks. And prior to that, we have these um, genealogies in the Puranas, which are, are in the Brihad Aranyak Upanishad. You have these genealogies of uh, Rishis which um, more than 100 generations, which and because the Rishi generation is not 20 years. You know, the royal generation could be 20 years uh, because at the age of, let's say, 20, 25, a new child is born, then he becomes the king and so on. But the Rishi generation, a Rishi can live to a long time and his grandson or somebody else or some other Rishi becomes his successor. So if you have more than 100 um, and then each is 30, that already takes you to 3,000 years, right? In Brihad Aranyak Operation. The problem is that we haven't made that case. What dismays me the most, uh, you know, these are well-meaning people who love India. They're saying, why aren't Westerners doing it? Why aren't, why aren't they revising their books? Listen, you have to seize the day. Carpe diem, right? You can't keep on saying, why isn't somebody else doing it? We have to do it. We have to do it and make a case as soberly, as critically as is possible. Um, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm glad that there's something happening. And we can always depend on the government because sadly, the Babudam, uh, which is associated with the Indian government because it's so overly centralized, and I was so saddened the other day that uh, Bibi Lal, uh, whom I know very well and who is 99, he's going to be 100 this year, um, who was Director General of India in 1950, just imagine, um, and, uh, or 1970, sorry, 1970, 50 years ago. Uh, his um, book, which he submitted to Arche Archaeological Survey of India after 69, the excavation for nine years that he conducted in Kalibangan has still not been published. It's still not been published. Can you believe it? And he's been complaining about it. People have been complaining about it. So I'm saying this to make the point that don't depend on the government. We have to do it ourselves. India was poor. Indians were poor. That's not the case. Indians are as wealthy as any people. We have to inspire people to collect the funds that are necessary to do these projects. And scholars with open mind come together, uh, investigate these genealogies, look at um, um, Egyptian history. These are all, these were accounts just like the Puranic accounts. Then why do they peg these years that this Pharaoh was 1530 to 1550? There's no contemporary account. How do they peg it? Because there are, they, they, have, uh, they, have, they have anchored these genealogies to one or two astronomical events. That this particular pharaoh, there was this astronomical event, so we are going to peg it there. And then they have, they are then, and then there's another one, and that's how they have constructed their history. We have to do something similar. 
But we have to do it very soberly. There are also complications. There are complications. For example, the Mahabharata era, you know, you have um, the beginning of the Kali Yuga, which is 35 years after um, after uh, 35 years after the war, right? Um, 3102 BCE. So the war took place 3137 BCE, right? But the earliest uh, accounts that we have, inscription, well, we have Aryabhata, uh, which is about 500 CE, or that there's an inscription which is um, 100 years later on. We, earlier to that, we don't have, um, we don't have uh, clarity because there were different eras. There was the Saptarshi era, which uh, goes back to 66, 76 BC. And in fact, in Kashmir, uh, we had the new Saptarshi era or Saptarishi era, which goes back to 3076 BC. Okay, so we have to do the work uh, about this. And then we have the Greeks, when they came with Alexander, they said the Indian uh, genealogies go back to about 66, 76 BCE. So somebody has to sit down and do it carefully. Now, there have been some efforts, and they've been done for many years. But I think uh, they are not totally satisfactory. Um, uh, you have to meet all the opposition, uh, the, the, the objections. If uh, Is it possible that 3102 was obtained through backdating by Aryabhata himself, because Varaha Mihir is 25, 26 BC. So why is there a contradiction? Now, one theory is that Varaha Mihir was from the from the Western regions, and there was another um, era because when he's talking of the Shakas, right, and that era was probably uh, Kusro or Kurush which is Cyrus, Kurush in uh, Western or in Old Persian. But, but it's got to be properly resolved. We can't just take it and then just to look at the numbers. Then we have to connect it to other texts. And sometimes we don't do it. So in other words, we have to make the case. We have to seize the narrative. And you know there are enough open-minded people in the West. In fact, most Westerners are open-minded, most scholars. It's only the ones who are a part of the patronage system associated with, sadly, Western Sanskrit departments or Western Indology departments, because they, they had a mutual patronage systems, system with the Indian university departments, which are controlled by the left, you know, after the 1970s. So, but no, these are just a few individuals. We should just not worry about them. You know, that will be all become a part of the dust dustbin of um, intellectual history, right? So, but we have to make a case. We cannot keep on complaining that why why doesn't such and such person revise his book? It, it, that's perfectly fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Let's write the stuff, do it as well as we can, and then the world will listen. So the, one of the problems is that there is so much information. There are so many disparate pieces of data that it's impossible for one person to study them all. We essentially need to join hands, create a consortium of researchers who would work on this together and collaborate on it. And that needs funding, that needs support from somewhere. So that, in my opinion, is one of the major problems we are facing. We have a number of people working separately, working individually, often at cross purposes. And then there are things like they come up with different interpretations and then there is a battle of egos and all that. So how do you propose to resolve this, this problem? Yeah, you know, now, um... 3102, you know, this is one of the key numbers, key uh, dates, 3102 BC. And um, now um, there's some friends of mine uh, who worked on it. Uh, for example, Narahari Achar from Memphis. And uh, he looked at the Mahabharata. Now you have these um, software. You can recreate the ancient skies. And Indians, you know, having done Vedic astronomy and having done many, spent many, many years doing it, all the ritual or a lot of the ritual was about 
things going on in the skies. In fact, a lot of the so-called mythology uh, that we have in Indian books is about also happenings in the sky because you know, bhu, bhuva, swaha, these are connections. Bandhu between uh, the adhi daivik, adhi bhautik, and adhyatmik. These are three layers. So these are very deep narratives. So a lot of stuff has to be done. Now, of course, there are these in the Mahabharata, for example, there are these uh, astronomical um, or astrological references. Now, Nadhari Achar examined them. He looked at the, the, the skies that have been recreated, and he came up with 3067 BC. Now, the same references uh, were examined by Iyengar in Bangalore, and he says 1500 BC. So what it, what it tells us is that uh, when you look at those um, uh, words in the shlokas that we have, uh, there is room for interpretation depending upon how you are seeing this and that. And therefore, um, I totally agree with you. One need one want, one needs for people to come together and debate this, and also, and then how do you get corrected? Well, then you go back to say archaeological evidence. There are also there's also stuff that we have in the uh, archaeological record. There are these um, uh, vedis or uh, these altars, or now they have discovered in Sinali they have discovered a chariot and so on. So people also or they have these buildings which are in different orientations, and these orientations change with time. And then you also have the nakshatra records or lists which change every thousand years, the nakshatra moves because of the precession. You know, you have the cycle of 26,000 years, you have 27 nakshatras. Or with the rashis, they move one rashi every 2,000 years. And as we know, uh, Indian festivals are all off by 23 days, right? We, are, we celebrate Makar Sankranti, the beginning of Uttarayana on 14th of January, when it should yes. really be on 21st of December. So we need to do all of that work. You know, the problem is our Jyotishis also have to awaken from just holding on to the past, because that's not what the Rishis did. If the Rishis did this amazing stuff, I can tell you with all humility, when I translated Kanada's Vaisheshik Sutras right, a few years ago, I was astonished. Greatest physicist before Newton. But why, no Indian physicist knows anything about Kanada. Why not? Why aren't we doing it with an open mind, going back and looking at what they did? And why did the Rishis did it? Because they had open mind. So we have to be open-minded and not hold on to now, uh, okay, we are connected to um, Makar Sankranti on 15th uh, January just because this is how it's been done for so many centuries. Now, from an astrological point of view, I have no problem. Let's do it that way. But at least, you know, I'm not saying that they should change Makar Sankranti. But we must say that certainly Uttarayan begins on 21st of because that's a tropical, you know, a tropical event. It begins on 21st of December. So we have to do all of this, though I totally agree. <clears throat> some, some of the wealthiest people in India also are in search for the truth, because not only does our tradition connect us to the mystery of our spirit, but it also has because of the fact that our past is continuous, unlike any other civilization. You know, every other civilization has been separated violently from its past, like the Egyptians, the Mesopotamian, the Greek, and certainly the Chinese because of communism and so on, right? And, and so um, we, in our tradition, we have this potential to reveal truths, not just for, for us of relevance to India, but for the entire world, because we are forefathers and foremothers, perhaps, where these 
obsessive travelers. They went in all directions. And we see evidence of that everywhere. And therefore, there is potential there for um, understanding um, which is of relevance far beyond India's borders. So we got to uh, reach these people and create a fund and then um, have a team of scholars um, and, and challenge each other. Because the only thing that we should be devoted to is truth. Challenge each other and come up um, with, uh, with, 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 a, um, with a sense which, uh, which, um, uh, which um, finds uh, connections uh, which hold up. And then write about it. And write about it as well as, it, as can be done. Um, and now uh, we can make use of the medium. You know, uh, the internet has changed uh, many equations. This is in many ways a much more equal world, although in some ways the guys who control the internet control the narrative as we saw with the deplatforming of people by uh, the social media companies only recently. But we can also leverage it. And if uh, Indian universities and NCERT don't change, we can sort of ignore them. You know, we can present this information. In fact, a lot of um, smart people, uh, thinking people uh, also tell us that the <clears throat> brick and mortar university might be uh, an anachronism now for the future. And uh, we must create new institutions. So there's an opportunity for us to leverage technology and spread this uh, to all corners of the world. And people are hungry for this knowledge. People in Russia, in Europe, want to get connected to their own past. And the Vedas are the key, in my view, because they are the oldest past that humanity possesses. I think the, one of the least, one of the smallest things the government of India can do is to establish a number of journals in which people can write about this. I mean, for example, we don't have any journals. We have to submit it, uh, submit any research to Western journals, mostly. So one of the least things the government of India can do is to establish a journal of ancient Indian history, wherein people can submit and establish an editorial board for, of reviewers. So I think that would be a good idea. Would you agree? Well, we have, I, I totally agree. We need many journals. You know, India is such a vast, complex, um, history and civilization with so many things which have been ignored in the official university narratives because the English just brought in Western subjects, you know. And um, as uh, my good friend who passed away last year, the great uh, Sanskritist and historian of art, uh, Kapila Vatsyayanji used to say that what the Westerners ignored is what has survived. And she was talking about music, for example, and yoga um, and, um, and art, because all other subjects, Indians were separated from their own past, right? from their own Shastras. But, uh, uh, but so, so we, do, we do need a lot of journals. Uh, uh, but there is one journal which has uh, published uh, good stuff, which is the in Indian Journal of History of Science, which is published by Indian National Science Academy. But but perhaps we can't depend on the universe, on the official government system. If B.B. Lal, the doyen of Indian archaeologists, cannot get his own research published by Archaeological Survey of India for 50 years after 1970, they don't publish it. Why haven't they published it? My guess is because he tried to connect his analysis, in his analysis, he tried to suggest that maybe these were Vedic people. You know, this is incredible. If that is what the case is, the book is going to come out under his name. Why can't a person, a scholar, have the freedom to say this, even if it's not a part of official orthodoxy? So we cannot depend on the government. I think if there is one lesson to all of this, is that we have to take control. We have to create academies, which is what Europe did. You know, these are academies controlled by scholars. So we have to do it. 
and 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 it's not that much of money anymore it's not as expensive to run a journal now if it's an internet based journal as it used to be in the past because you had to mail these journal copies to the subscribers and so on so i think one of the um, challenges facing us uh, which we should have a solution to uh, quite easily is to create uh, some kind of a body which uh, comes up which deliberates and comes up with um, um, with ways to um, you know start with three or four journals in the beginning um, because you do have you have um, um, you have uh, Puratattva, which is done by Archaeological Survey of India but there are only one or two issues a year you need more stuff and you also need to be open minded in my view uh publish also stuff elsewhere in the world i think india you know um um india has to perceive itself not only um hemmed in by its geography in a certain sense india is the whole world right now um uh, so um we should be open minded uh, and associate people outside of india as well look at work which is done outside of india as well because that's also a breath of fresh air you know we want other voices as well to come in so i think that's what we should do one of the things that we should do uh, and can't depend on the government because government agencies because india needs huge reform in the way these agencies are run and we are not sure that that reform will be done anytime soon and we can't keep on waiting so carpe diem you know that latin phrase See, let's seize the day ourselves would you agree that uh, the fact that we are currently divorced from the sanskrit language is it affecting the way we perceive our past is it disconnecting us from the past for example scientists would want to research indian science history or indian astronomical data but if they don't know sanskrit then they would have to rely on translations done, done by others so is this one of the major problems we are facing well uh, fortunately there are translations of all these books a lot of good stuff has been done by scholars both uh, in the west and in india especially a lot of indian scholars a lot of stuff for example astronomy etc indian journal of history of science uh, carries all these translations and commentaries so there there's some good scholars uh, who have done for example work on the kerala school of mathematics and astronomy um and many of them are my my friends and it's accepted all across the world so if somebody did not know sanskrit they can still get into it uh and and in a, in a sense all indians know sanskrit because all indian languages including tamil is tamil is maybe 60% sanskritic but you look at malayalam it's maybe 95% gujarati punjabi bengali hindi literally sanskrit you know there are prakrit forms of sanskrit it's it's like you know ancient greek and modern greek if you know only modern greek you can't read ancient greek so but they they call it one language maybe all of indian languages could still have been called sanskrit so in that sense we all know sanskrit right so we can get to know uh, sanskrit rather quickly in fact dr lord I, um, i forget no no uh, forget the name one he he did one of the major translations of musicology books from india and he says he just passed away i think a couple of years ago i forget uh, his exact name he said that he with, without knowing sanskrit formally you know when he realized that this was the problem he just plowed into the book and learned sanskrit and then you know in a couple of years you you know both you look at western scholars they don't know sanskrit they 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 do grammar etc and then they get into text and many of them even after they done it for many years really don't know sanskrit that well and they make very elementary mistakes so i don't think that is the real problem the real problem is that sadly over the last 50 60 years an antipathy ideological antipathy has been built up to sanskritic tradition of india and sadly the left has been pushing it as if sanskrit was this medium of oppression yes so sanskritic knowledge is to be decried and so it's a part of perpetuation of that colonial control over indian minds that colonization of indian mind 
and 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 so people have to break free of these shackles and these shackles do control some people and so for them uh for them you know doing ancient history is a terrible thing that forget india ancient india it's all gomutra you know it's just yes. ridiculing the past ridiculing the past you know it's like um you, you don't uh, um, horse urine uh, is used to create um, uh, steroids which are a very pa important part of allopathic medicine right now all right go mutra might have been used and maybe it was not used in a in a sense which which in an antiseptic modern chemical process and but you can't use these uh, 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 these um, labels to completely decry the entire past. And sadly, what happens is sometimes uh, not so thoughtful lovers of Indian tradition push these extreme things on to the stage so that the the enemies of Indian past and history, seize onto it and say that these people are you know regressives they want to take india back to superstition and and so it's a complicated battle going on and or what they say they seize on to things such as that well indians believe that they had air, airplanes and they had a, a hydrogen bomb atom bomb uh, well you there are other ways to deal with that information indeed there are these stories and these stories are very important element and they create um, questions. For example, in uh, I think it's in Sabha Parva of Mahabharata, there's this mention of uh, the people in these airplanes wearing airtight suits attacking the city and so on. So perhaps the way to deal with it is that look at this imagination. Isn't this another element related to the mystery of consciousness? How were the rishis? able to think of issues which have become relevant in this universe only now and i think that is that is the that is the that is a magical way of looking at all of this magical and modern and contem contemporary way and nobody can challenge you on that because it, it's it's indeed true um, that in no other culture where such stories a, such a fundamental part of their, their myth making. You have Icarus, of course, in Greek history, but it's he's just flying to the sun. You don't have the kind of stories that we have. You have stories also of um, transplantation of baby from one uterus to another, right? Cloning. Uh, and these are fundamental part of the story. So I think what this does is it really opens up the mind to the possibilities, because the, the the Rishi also said that you can, you know, in, in some sense, and as a as a physicist, you and I know that uh, the whole question of time itself is such a uh, mysterious one. You know, if something is going to happen in the future, then in some sense, the potential of that already exists in the past. So the past and the future are, in fact, connected. And of course, the Rishi was supposed to be a Trikal Darsha, right? He knows all uh, the past and the future in, in a certain sense, not in a literal sense. So there's so much of wisdom, so much of incredible wisdom that exists in our tradition. So this antipathy for Sanskrit is closely related to the antipathy for what they call Brahmanism. And then there is this uh, very concerted effort to dealing hinduism from buddhism from jainism etc so so why why is this happening and why has india never made an effort to decolonize itself see what happened was <clears throat> the whole idea of hierarch hierarchical varnas castes you know was created i believe in 1901 english census because the 19, 1879 census i believe because i've written something on it and i have the references there um, uh, when the british went to uh, north india census punjab and all the all that region uh, they went to the various jatis 
and they said what varna do you have they said we don't have any varna we are these jatis we do this and that right we do everything so and they they wrote up their thing and said, these jatis are you know like different communities which in modern uh, language would be different ethnic groups and they did different things at different times um, and uh, but then in the 1901 census they said no if you don't know what your varna is we're going to tell what your caste is that's when the idea of caste was born and then some and of course some of their informants were brahmins right and so they they made this uh, idea that brahmins were at the top which is totally false brahmins are generally as we know people who have done more recent uh, anthropological work in india and these are sociologists and anthropologists they discovered brahmins brahmins never sit at the top it's the landowner it's the money guy with the money it's the raja and so on it's a much more complex re- uh, idea even after the perpetuation of this uh, um, uh, colonization uh, or colonizing idea which many indians have internalized and 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 so uh, this idea of these um, uh, hierarchical jatis or castes i i never use the word caste because there's no um, analog to it in any indian language we have the idea of jati and we have the idea of varna but the texts also tell us that within each human being is purusha from purusha primal purusha where these varnas born which are classes you know as a doctor for example the idea was that because you are you are engaged in service so you are a shudra you know as a class not as an individual every human being is has the same purusha every human being this is my interpretation i've written for anthropological journals also on this question every human being has all the four varnas within him or her within at in different tasks we are a we are we are a brahman in certain tasks we are a kshatriya we must fight for ourselves we are a kshatriya we are a vaishya we must also do this and we are also in service of others in our family and beyond in in the community so sadly uh we have internalized it and so there's a lot of rage uh, within communities who uh, who have been um uh, who have been sort of pegged down for example I'm, i i i believe what was done was that the kayasthas who were you know the the writers the ministers into the rajas all over north india in up were termed to be between um, brahmins and kshatriyas you know when the british did their census so the kayasthas were happy and they said well, we are actually brahmins and then we started becoming uh, bookkeepers or ministers then we became kayasthas but in calcutta the bengali brahmins said the kayasthas were shudras so the kayasthas who are some of the smartest people you know dattas you know like swami vivekananda the ghoshes and so on so there's a lot of rage part of the sociology of cpm is that what is this and in a certain sense that rage is justified because uh, clearly this whole idea of hierarchy of individual is false it's not a part of our tradition and and then we also know uh, uh, anthropologists know that whole communities now of course there are certain communities they said we are devoted to this and this we are rajaputras we are rajputs we are we are kshatriyas we are khatris or what we are going to be devoted to fighting and this and that that's not we are not we are not denying any of historical truth of india right but there were certain communities like the saurashtras do you know saurashtras in madurai a powerful community they were weavers and so on now there we know that they came down from gujarat and originally they were farmers they were farmers who used to be you know if you're service then you would be called shudra for example then they went came down and over 1000 years now they call themselves 
Brahmins, and they are Brahmins. I know some of the most brilliant people who belong to this Saurashtra community, and they are their children have gone to all these Ivy League colleges and so on. But now, in that process, they have internalized certain things. They become vegetarians, which they probably were not, and so on. Not that one has to be a vegetarian, because the Kashmiris pundits, for example, who also I, I wrote a paper for on it for uh, annals for the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. When, when the Kashmiri pundits, just like the, uh, the Khotanis um, in Central Asia, when they suffered their catastrophic destruction, um, they, um, they were, of course, wiped out. They, they were totally wiped out in Khotan. But in Kashmir, when we had our genocides, at some point, uh, what they said was that all communities in Kashmir who were devoted to their past would now be one community. So Kashmiri Pandits really are all the communities who, who survived the different genocides that they suffered over literally one a century, you know, uh, late 1900s, the late 1800s. It's very interesting, one a century, not as often as the Yazidis um, who were probably the remnants of the Vedic Mitannis uh, in West Asia. Um, and they've suffered horrib uh, horribly, you know, especially in the recent past. But so have the Kashmiri Pandits. So the communities where, you know, people became fighters, so they became uh, Kshatriyas. This is what it was. These Varnas of communities were fluid. And they were fluid uh, until this uh, tragedy befell India in the 1800s, where our share of the world gross product, economic, you know, GDP, fell from 30% um, in uh, 1800 to about 1.4% 1 by 1914 and 2 or 3% by 1947, you know, after there was some industry that came in because the English de industrialized India. And because now they didn't do it violently. What they did was there was industrialization, industrial revolution in Europe. They didn't allow something similar to take place in India. So India became poor. The communities turned on each other. There was truly, you know, there was not enough food to go around. There were these famines, which an author called the late Victorian Holocaust, which took place, many of them took place in India. And so what we are doing, and these people who have this rage against this imagined Brahmin, um, you know, oppression of various centuries, Brahm Brahmanical patriarchy. We remember Jack Dorsey standing up when he came to Delhi. You know, these are stupid people. They don't know history. They don't know history, either history of the world, and certainly not uh, history of India. So this is an imagined Brahmanical patriarchy, which, uh, the young are fighting against. They have to destroy Brahmanical knowledge. And to destroy Brahmanical knowledge, they have to destroy Sanskrit. And they have to destroy everything that is a part of Indian past. And they believe that people like you and I are making it up. There is no such physics or chemistry or mathematics in India. It's all being made up. They don't, they don't, they don't care to look up Indian Journal of History of Science and all of these books. So they truly believe, you know, because self-deception is so much easier than one imagines. If you believe something doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Why has India never made an attempt to decolonize? Is it a, is it a failure of leadership? You know, you read Vivekananda, you read, read Aurobindo especially, Aurobindo crying a hundred years ago about this decolonization. And what happened, I believe, was after 47, I think leadership at that time, people like Nehru, you know, if you read his discovery of India or his autobiography, he speaks of how at that time when he was studying in London or England, uh, Indians were at the bottom of that racial totem pole. You know, you had the Nordics, then you had the French, then you had the Italians, then you had this and this, and Indians were at the bottom. So there was this deep sense of inferiority that people like Nehru had. 
and with that deep sense of inferiority. And there was also this sense of inferiority that India had because of that experience that they had, you know, with antipathic forces which didn't love India. You know, Indian history has been quite a bad, you know, record in in the history of humankind past several centuries. Look at North India. There are almost no temples which are older than two or three hundred years after Ahalya Bai uh, built, rebuilt, for example, temples in uh, Kashi and so on, excepting the temples in the forest, right, which survived, or perhaps in the uh, hills of Himachal and uh, Uttarakhand, where the Rajas kept on ruling until the time of the British. So, uh, uh, so because of all of that, there was deep sense of inferiority. That's why people turn to socialism, that this is what is going to set us free. Because socialism is a simplistic, uh, communism is a simplistic ideology. Uh, mind, we are not just machines, you know, doing human work, physical work. Uh, the mind is so much more complex than our body. And there are so many layers. Cognition itself is so complex. What knowledge is, you know, once you do physics and psychology, it's so much more complex than all the simplistic ideas of Marx, right? Uh, uh, Marx and Lenin and so on. So there was this deep sense of inferiority, and Mr. Nehru and his successors uh, then decided to give a certain orientation. But at, or certainly until the 1960s, there were other scholars as well who were presenting the more nuanced history. But Mrs. Gandhi did this devil's bargain with the communists. And the communists uh, are, the left wants to destroy because they believe all the good things about Indian history are imagined, that they don't exist. Because India was really a horrible place. And now, of course, there is a slight a variation to it that maybe Buddhists were good because they were more materialist. They didn't uh, invoke the Atman. So maybe whatever little good was in India came in from the West, from Bactria, because Bactria was Buddhist. So this is all so foolish. You know, you have these Buddhologists and Western Buddhist scholars also who are also quite shallow, uh, in my view, because you go back to and you look at, for example, uh, Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, right? And you find the Buddha himself speak of the Atman. And he's saying that, look, I didn't tell you about the Atman because you were too attached to your ritual without understanding it. But now that I'm dying, uh, there is something which exists, which persists. And that is the heart of India. Indian civilization is this idea of the Atman. And this idea of the Atman opens up this entire new door, which opens up one to perceptions at so many different levels. And that is what the world is craving for now, since we are at that this juncture where, you know, if machines can also do what we do 95% of our time in our offices and else, then what is all life about, right? That is the big challenge of our times. And I think that's where, rather than hate Sanskrit as some Indians do, um, and all Sanskritic knowledge, perhaps if they were to be a bit more open-minded and just say that, OK, let's at least see what they have to say and find out what they have to say, and then, OK, dismiss it or reject it. But if they were to just give it a few weeks or months, their eyes will open. And they'll know, because I'm sure they also love India. They know that they have been so misguided. And uh, talking about Buddhism, one of the one of the remarks that I get very often, I, I stated in, in one of my videos that there is no real difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. So the comments that I get is that Bud, the Buddha Siddhartha Gautam was an Indian prince who broke away from Hinduism, and that the basic tenets and core values are very different. So Buddhism, they say, is essentially the antithesis of Hinduism. Hinduism has Atma or soul, and Buddhism doesn't have that. So what is your, what would you like to say about that? 
Okay, you know, one of the uh, scholars whom I respect a lot, Anand Kumaraswamy, he was from Sri Lanka, and he's a great scholar of um, Indian civilization and temples and art. He wrote a book called Hinduism and Buddhism, and it's uh, freely available on the internet. He says that the deeper you study the both, you discover there's no difference at all. Superficially, there might be difference, you know, in ritual. And clearly, there is now some difference in the ritual. Um, there's more emphasis on meditation, possibly. You go to a Japanese uh, Zen uh, shrine, for example. But really, the deeper you study, you discover it's identical. And I believe they're identical. Because Mahayan, for example, took all the devis and devatas and incorporated them in their own system, in their own theology. And so these uh, devatas, as we know, are the cognitive centers within our mind, um, which uh, open up um, the inner sky, the chidakash, right? You have chitta akash and chidakash, and you have the bhautik akash. This is, you know, all the mystery that we have of reality. So they open up, and that's why meditation um, takes us in different directions. So I think people who say that they are different, they don't understand it at all. And even in Hinayan, you know, Theravad, you have uh, Buddha speaking about who is an ideal Brahman, right? He, speak about, he speaks about Brahman not in the sense of class here, Brahman in the sense of who is devoted to Brahma Bhut, right? To the pathway to the knowledge of Brahman. And it's identical. In my case, in my view, it's identical. Now, it's certainly true that uh, with Nagarjuna, etc., you had later on, many centuries after Buddha's death, you had this uh, uh, tradition that arose of Anatmavad, right? You had the, uh, the Hinduism with its Atmavad and um, Buddhism with its Anatmavad. But this Anatma, this Anatta in Pali, right? Anatta is really the representation of the Upanishadic uh, Mahavakya Neti Neti. There are two ways to look at reality. There are two ways to look at Brahman as uh, Aham Brahmasmi. You know, you're looking at all kinds of attributes that you can associate with it, right? Which is the way, for example, of Kashmir Shaivism, because Kashmir Shaivism embraces embodied reality also as a as a reflection of Brahman, and that's why it's so engaged with uh, with the world, like all Tantra systems are. Kashmir Shaivism is a tan Tantric Advaitic system. Um, now, uh, uh, so um, the, the Anatmavad is like Neti Neti, not this, not this. So no words. So Atman is a word. So we are not going to use a word. So that's, that's it. In that sense, it's that Shunyata from which emerges everything because we cannot associate any word with it. I don't see it any different from uh, from uh, the Upanishadic uh, system, which is the Veda, which is the Veda described in terms of, you know, different formulae. So I see that even the Buddhists from other countries, they believe that Buddhism and Hinduism are separate religions. So how did this perception <laughs> develop? Is it that the Western conceptualization of separating these two has been adopted elsewhere as well? Absolutely, I think so. It, I think uh, to see how they separated, we have to see how Hinduism and Sikhism separated. You know, they separated only 120 years ago uh, after Sri Guru uh, Gurudwara Pramandan Committee, after Macaulay, right, the Englishman, um, who said, "No, you're different." You because at that time they had the same priests, uh, even um, at Hari Mandir, you know, in um, in uh, um, Amritsar, they had the same priests at the priests in Hindu temples. So they said after that the Sikhs started saying um, the official ideology was that the the the, the names of um, Shiva or Govind or Rama and and Krishna are not the Rama and Krishna of the Puranas. But they are different names of the nameless God, of Vaheguru or Swaha. Vaheguru is really Swaha Guru. Not everybody knows that, right? Swaha Guru. Um, so 
So they are. So the same thing was done by the Western colonialist scholars. They said no, Buddhism is different because of this tradition. They they are looking at symbols. You know, it's like what's happening right now in the West, uh, and they are being very uh, consistent with that. They are saying now, um, intent is important, right? Um, now the, the the two genders don't exist. You are. It doesn't matter whether you're biologically a male. If you say you're female, you're a female, and so on. Separation. You're going to, through analysis, divide everything further and further. So go back, and Buddhism and Hinduism. Because until about 120 years ago, even in Thailand, um, they they had um, all the Vedic ritual, and perhaps it's still a part of the consecration of the king. The Vedic ritual. I think what really happened. And it's perfectly fine for a scholar to say all of this. The problem was that the counter voice, the voice of the Vedic interlocutor, that died out. It was not what the Western scholar was doing. I think I should not really blame them. They're not the fall guys. It's because our voice was lost. Our voice has not been added to the debate. There's only one person, and he's not even a, a native Indian, Ananda Kumaraswamy. Uh, who stood up because a lot of other Indian scholars also uh, started analyzing in Western categories. And I was actually quite shocked when um, I read, uh, you know, the, the famous Hindi poet Ramdhari Singh Dinkar, his uh, much lauded book, uh, Itihas Ke Char Adhyay, where he analyzes Indian history and he does it in Western colonial anthropological categories. So a lot of Indian scholars have also internalized all this. So it's a big, big thing. And when the Indian scholar stands up and he says, look, what you're saying is false. It's false, not because I would like to believe it, but because for certain such reasons, right? They're not really different. Zen, what is the difference between Zen and Vedanta? There really isn't. Zen is, of course, Chan, which is Dhyan. So it's dhyan. They're focusing on the paradoxes, which is a part of our own Vedantic tradition. So we have to, they're still holding on in Japan. They're holding on to Siddham script. They're holding on to their worship of Saraswati. They worship Saraswati more than we do. That's what our problem is through Ben Zaiten. You know, they're worshiping Ben Zaiten everywhere, which is the Japanese name for Saraswati. So until such time, that we once again place Saraswati in the front and worship her and be empowered and go out and say, this is what the truth is. Everybody would listen. Even Western scholars, they are also, they also want to know the truth. They, if they are, have been misguided by their own, you know, marinated in their echo chamber, marinated and all these ideas in their Echo, echo chambers that hey this is different that Buddha went his own way uh, then clearly they also want to be awakened from this dream sleep you know this is all dream sleeps Indians are in this dream sleep so are a lot of the Western scholars and they are discovering you know now that the West is facing this existential threat to their econ economy to their whole way of living because they can't compete with the Chinese. Um, they they will have to confront all these questions. The universities are going to die because students don't want to won't, won't spend sixty eighty thousand dollars a year when there are no jobs uh, at the end of this. Where where all that they've been told in these four years are these stories which they can read for free anyway on the internet. So they are going to be confronting these questions. It's only when you confront when you are in this moment of life and death that you that you turn your face away from the vanities you held on to because they, you were comfortable in them. So a lot of this Western scholarship is, you know, these series of vanities. So there's a lot of lot in common between India and the countries of Eastern Asia, a lot of culture in common. Would you say that we should create a consortium of Dharmic nations, just like the West has NATO and etc. I mean, some kind of cultural consortium where we can all get together and and 
research each, other, each other's cultures and find out the similarities and uh, create a new uh, narrative of of who we are well i think we should i think there is uh, this international ramayan conference that takes place where a lot of people from all over southeast asia come together but i don't think you can do it on a political level i think in politics we must be realists you know i i don't personally um, i think idealism um, which is what uh, mr nehru did uh, that's that that blinds you to reality of events and you make serious mistakes no i think we should do much more culturally um and um, people everywhere even you know i i am told that in shang in beijing and shanghai a lot of the chinese people who do software they want to study sanskrit they are doing sanskrit classes because all the uh, buddhist uh, classics mahayan classics uh, were originally translated from sanskrit by people like kumar ajib who incidentally was a half kashmiri right the great uh, translator uh, the lotus sutra is still chanted in the translation that he did in uh, 240 or ce or whatever so i think we need to do it but we don't we don't need to do it through it, through the government the problem being the indian official anglo sphere you know the the elite sphere is anti dharmic that other cultures are not you go to indonesia you talk to people you go to borobudur you talk to those workers and they are connected to the tradition even though they might be muslims you know nominally nominally, nominally muslim and as we know indonesia is also a very interesting uh, country where you have the um, you have the small minority of the orthodox people trying to impose their view on the vast majority who are still doing their you know the slavic do very their truth the inner inner truth is still the old um, uh, hindu uh, hindu buddhist because Buddhists there also said, "Well, Shiva and Buddha are the same." You know that's their uh, big uh, slogan. So uh, they are still connected. So there is a lot that can be done. Or you look, go to um, go to Vietnam. The Chams, the Chams are 80, the Champa. Champa, Champa yes. Eighty-five percent Muslim, but fifteen percent are still Hindu, and they're called Balaman from Brahman. but we have not done anything the last 70 years have we built bridges with these people they need help yazidis need help culturally not to impose in indian culture but to open them to the wisdom of the vedas as universal knowledge not as caste etc you know that is that is where we put this big millstone around our necks next and say hey we are your teachers no we hey see this for yourself because every nobody can lift anybody else each person each culture each society has to lift itself up but we should certainly assist them in doing so and even chinese would want it china is also facing a existential crisis right now it might be on the top and right now the west may not be able to compete with it but ultimately the chinese chinese are a good people too you know they have yeah, a, yes. they have a communist dictatorship they also want to know the truth everybody wants to know the truth everybody wants to know who are we each human being confronts death but so what is the meaning of our life and that is what atma vidya is about that's what the veda is all about so india i would say has a has an enormous diaspora I mean, if you look at Cambodia, a significant percentage of the population has Indian genetics, and the same goes for Indonesia as well. And Central Asia, it has been Turkified about 700 years ago, but before that, it was all Indian, or you could say Eastern Indo-European. And even in Europe, we have this vast Romani diaspora, which who are essentially nothing but Indians. They look Indian even now. So, India should reconnect with these people. It would it would really. Uh, change the dynamics cultural dynamics of the world oh absolutely uh, but not just ethnically i think we also have to be more expansive not just with people who are genetically connected to the indian bloodlines right as you correctly pointed out 
Cambodia, Indonesia, um, Central Asia, um, uh, and and elsewhere, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. But be more expansive. I think this is the time we in the global village. We and of course people will do things uh, at a personal level. But and we must also do outreach with the Romani people because they've been a, a people who have suffered a lot, uh, a lot in history. So we also have to reach and you know through karuna, compassion and connection and help them uh, pick up and find that strength in themselves. As many of them are trying to do, and they're saying that look, um, we are uh, we came from Northwest India and. We are probably judged, and you know, Shiva was uh, our deity, and this and that, and so on. So, so we we need to do that. But I think we got to go beyond that. And I think some of that is being done by anonymous Indians. You know, these yoga teachers. You find them everywhere in Peru, in Norway, in Hungary, um, and they're not not necessarily scholars, but through their through reaching out, through empathy. They are opening people up because everybody in this age, post-industrial age, inflection point, 2020, the past is dead and done for. You know, we are in a new world. I think this, all this would be much more significant than before. And people would want those connections. I think we should do that, connect up with everybody. Uh, but the biggest battle, in my view, would be in India, because in India, they westernized India hating, Sanskrit hating elite is so entrenched, it's not easy to fight them. You know, they have their own publications, they have all the elite journals and newspapers they control, and the West sees India through their lens. And they say, well, who, how you can't blame us, because this is what we are reading in Indian newspapers. Or Indian magazines like Caravan, right? Yes, yes. Right. So you spoke about Kashmir and the relation between Kashmir and uh, Xinjiang, for example. So could you elaborate on that? Because there, there is clearly a very deep connection between the people of Kashmir and the people of Xinjiang and, and even Uttar Madra, right? Well, uh, Uttar Kuru was just north of Kashmir. Uh, which is Xinjiang, and Uttar Madra originally was further west. But at some point, the term Uttar Madra became um, uh, unfashionable because in Aitareya uh, Brahman, you have or Aranyak, you have both Uttar Madra and Uttar uh, Uttar Kuru. And as I, I told you earlier, Ptolemy speaks of Uttar Kuru. Uh, Uttar Koros, I think he calls it, right? Uttar Kuru. And there was a lot of, well, the language, one of the languages of Uttar Kuru was Gandhari. Gandhari is a, uh, is, has elements which are, has many elements which are similar to Kashmiri. Um, there are certain, you know, Dardic, uh, the Dardic language group, uh, which is also, it's an Indo Aryan language, of course. So the texts in, um, the Xinjiang texts or the Khotanis texts were discovered in these Dunhuang caves uh, about a hundred years ago. You know, you had Stein, for example, did important work in bringing some of these texts uh, down. Now, I'm shocked that Indian scholars don't work on it. There are no, there's no Indian scholar I know of. When I was writing my paper on Uttar Kuru and the Slavs and so on, and I've been assembling this dictionary of Sanskrit and you know, Sogdian language. I wrote to my contacts in JNU. I said, "Is there? You have a um, department of uh, Central Asian languages and so on." They said, "There's nobody who works on ancient stuff. They only do recent politics. There should be at least somebody. Maybe and well, Sanskrit department faculty should be doing it. You know, not everybody has to work on Yoga Sutra or on this or that." People should be more curious. More Indians should also. And now it's not. You don't have to really go to a library. Every all this stuff is available at our fingertips. You can bring this down. You can study it, and so much more understanding will emerge. Because as as uh, I was in touch with this editor who has done uh, this huge 
3,000 page dictionary of Tokharian, Tokharian B, which was north of uh, Khotan, which is also an Indo-European uh, language, uh, could be Indo-Aryan, but no Indo-Aryan scholar has worked on it. So I, I asked this guy, I said, when you were looking at, you you, you look at Tokhar, uh, Tokharia or uh, um, the, 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 that region uh, north of Khotan, and why are you going and looking at connections with German? Why aren't you looking, which is so far away, thousands and thousands of miles away, why don't you look at connections with Kashmiri? Kashmiri is just, and we have attested interaction and huge Indian communities um, in um, Tibetan records who lived there, who spoke Indian languages. And you had these missionaries all the way to the Mongolian world. And you find Sanskrit words even in Mongolian, right? All the way, Altai mountains and, and so on. And Tengri, even the religion of Genghis Khan, uh, uh, Tengri has a Sanskritic etymology also. Tanugiri, you know, Tanu, the, the expanding mountain, which is what the sky is. So there's many of the critical words in Mongolian have Sanskrit etymologies, and they were probably absorbed through uh, missionaries. And not only Buddhists, you know, this, this false division, dichotomy, Buddhism, Hinduism, that Khotan was Buddhist. Well, they also discovered Krishna worship. They, they have Shiva is everywhere, all over Central Asia. Yeah, Maheshwara, everywhere. In China, Danhuang, right? All the way to Japan. I think if this dichotomy, just as the Sikh Hindu dichotomy, this Buddhist Hindu dichotomy, and because the Hindu mind, the Indian mind has become colonized, the Indian scholar says, well, the Buddhism is something separate, so we're not going to study it. We are not interested in Central Asia because it is Buddhist. That is very foolish, right? Because firstly, there was no such dichotomy. You, you have Ramayana in Central Asia as well. Um, and in Tibet as well. I, I wrote a column on this for Medium a couple of years ago. So, so I think finally to come back, I would say don't blame the Western scholar. And, and the least we can say is that most Western scholars, or most good Western scholars, even if they're misguided, are trying to do their best they're operating within a certain paradigm. This is what they're being told. And they're trying to push it as far as they can. So we should praise them. So I praise them, even if they are wrong. I blame Indian scholars. There is literally a vacuum. There is very few people. And I think it's high time. And sadly, because of various reasons, we can't depend on the government. I think we should approach um, people, different, there are other um, societies within India or individuals who are well wishers, um, create some, some uh, system so that this scholar, this work can be done. And this work would also offer, you know, it's like, why do we travel into a forest to be rejuvenated? Because a forest, you know, in, in Indian uh, theory, there's always this dichotomy, uh, Aranya and Gram. Uh, a person has to prove himself in the Aranya, which is the forest, before he can come back and claim kingship, right? So likewise, in research, you have to go to the Aranya. Don't just keep on doing the same books over and over again. Go to the Aranya. Go to these texts from Central Asia. Do the uh, uh, Sanskrit texts from Central Asia. Go to Japan. Go to Sogdia, go to the Slavic world. They also need help. Just don't think of ourselves. Let's think of the rest of the world. And then wonderful things will happen. The problem in Indian academia is that there is no incentive for being creative. Actually, there are significant disincentives for being creative and trying to forge your own path. For example, if you go into academia, you've got to struggle for the first 20 years before you can establish anything. For example, if you look at the history of quantum mechanics in Europe, people like Schrodinger, Heisenberg, uh, Einstein, etc. They were full professors by the time they were 30 years old. In India, by the time you're 30 years old, you're just, just a newbie. You're still struggling. So the system is such that 
you, you're supposed to struggle and just follow orders. You're not supposed to try and forge your own path. So that's one of the big problems that we have in the Indian academic system. Absolutely. I think that's a big problem. And again, the solution, since the university system all across the world is going to be under tremendous pressure, although India has an opportunity there to become a teacher for the rest of the world also using the internet. But, you know, I don't know whether the Babus in Delhi have the imagination and vision to take advantage of that opportunity. But leaving that aside, I think the private sector has to step in. We have to create a new kind of an academy because education is going to be different from the way it's been done, not just in India, all over the world. So how do we create that academy? A kind of a Gurukul, internet-based Gurukul system uh, where uh, there is focus on, on the inner development because ultimately it's not information because now all the information can be within a computer, right? Uh, for a long time, education in India and the rest of the world was about information. You have to memorize this information or you have to have uh, the skills to uh, get this information very quickly from books. But now the emphasis in education all over the world would be intuition, pragya, you know, from information, from, uh, from just... Uh, uh, just data now we want intuition and how do we build that intuition that's what the gurukul system did so that when you have that intuition then doorways then you have that pratibha then doorways open up and then you see things of what they are that's what true education is all about so how to do it are people thinking of doing it i don't know uh, but i think this is what needs to be done and uh, um, and uh, maybe you know, if just a few people got together and brainstormed it and uh, and saw how the internet can be harnessed to do it and not make it Indian ethnic. You know, we should be thinking of world problems and world issues and world knowledge because these are all universal things. We're all the same. It's not about patriarchy. And we have to tell people, don't be afraid. It's not Brahmanical oppression. <laughs> Nothing to do with Brahmins. It's about Brahman, the, the deepest mystery of the universe. You know, the Gurukul system in the past, in ancient India, was to a large extent subsidized by the state. But today, the private education system is all about making money. So how do we reconcile these two? Well, you know, uh, part of the problem is that, as Dharampal in his book, the beautiful tree shows that before the Indian education system was destroyed by the English, uh, the temples uh, were partialas and they had acharyas. And people from all jatis used to study because there is the jati wide breakup also, including Muslim kids used to come to the partialas and used to study. Okay, now the the temples, so the temples were like the churches, the great churches who had their seminaries, but but, but much more because uh, India was all about broad education. It was not Bible, one book, you know, talking about one individual. They, 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 were, they, taught, they were taught Vedanta, Vyakaran, this, Sanskrit, and this and that. So what is required in my view you can't dismantle the present system, which is fine. I mean, it's teaching you certain skills. So good, the schools and colleges are great. We need to revive that Gurukul system in the temples. So that, um, and the temples have money. Now that temple, that money is being misused. And not only that, a lot of government officials are wasting their time running temples. The Tamil Nadu government has runs 37,000 temples. Why? What business do they have? So they have to, India needs to, to in, in order to become free, these temples have to let to be let go. But you can't let them go and have just ritual. Okay, that's some element which is good for some people who want, you know, comfort. Ritual is also good for comfort. And for some, it could be a part of sadhana. 
So we don't decry ritual. But really, education, gurukuls, should be temple-based. So temples have to be reborn. In fact, I've been urging uh, temples in America to start this process. Because in the, America has great temples, hundreds, great, beautiful temples. And they have classes. They do teach, but they're teaching mostly, you know, uh, they, they teach for children, school children, weekends um, all across America. But go beyond, be more ambitious, start a PhD program. And in America, being a free country, you can do things. You can start your PhD program. In India, you can't do it. And you, because in America, you have different accrediting bodies. And you can say, you can do join up with one of those, start your program. And ultimately, the proof of your education is how good you are. Once you produce good people, people would say, yeah, this is a good program, right? You don't have to have a PhD degree to become a full professor. Eric Erickson, you know, the, the psychoanalyst who wrote great books like Gandhi's Truth, he didn't have a PhD. Freeman so, Dyson. Huh? Freeman but, Dyson. Yeah, that. Freeman yeah. Dyson doesn't have e So, So we can do it. I think what India lacks the most even though Indians are the most successful entrepreneurs in the world right now. Indians are amongst the wealthiest people in, in the world. But they are operating within a system. India still lacks is Atma Vishwas. Yes. Once we have Atma Vishwas, we can change the world. And sometimes, of course, people say that one can't be this expansive. You know, Aurobindo spoke about uh, India as being Vishwa Guru, right? And perhaps maybe that's talking too big. But truly, as inheritors to unique tradition of knowledge, the Vedas, you know, not, not as caste. We've got to jettison all of that as the knowledge within it. And this is knowledge which everybody, every thoughtful person is craving in all corners of the world, every human being. So we need to bring it to be all people all over the world. And one medium that we have are the temples. We already have these institutions. But how do we join or create some body which interfaces with these temples, which shows them the way? Because the temples are being run by people who are not looking past the ritual or past the social comfort element of the temple. So we have to inspire them. Hey, this is a much bigger challenge. It's a much bigger story. And let's do it. People come together. The world will be different, in my view. So I think that the key to freeing the soul of India is to free the temples from government control. Absolutely. Absolutely. And give them another dimension. You know, you go to Vishwanath Temple in uh, in uh, Banaras, in Varanasi. And OK, well, people uh, line up at uh, 3 AM. And they have a darshan for two two minutes or not two minutes, maybe 10 seconds and come out and fine. You know, that gives them comfort. But wouldn't it be great if Vishwanath Temple also had an academy uh, next to it? And, you know, the Garbhagriha, etc. The temple is great for one element. Had another one, which was doing further expositions of this knowledge because every knowledge needs to be renewed for every generation. Right, you have the old text, but they have to be rewritten in new ways, um, even though one may not be saying anything new, anything novel. So, and do research because they, we also we are also opening up new vistas through new sciences like uh, like uh, functional MRI. We are able to look into the brain. That opens up a new vocabulary. Perhaps that also should be made a part of all this knowledge. Right? So that these places would be centers of knowledge for every human being in the world. But we have to have Atma Vishwas. I, I don't think many people would feel comfortable. They would say, oh, this is too much. Let's be <laughs> it. So, But we have to. We have to believe. Just like Hanuman could not fly since this sharp had been placed on him. You know, he was very naughty when he was a baby. He could fly and he would take the shaligrams from one ashram and place that on the other. So he was told, you will, you will not know that you can fly. And then it was reformed and said, or modified and said, until you are told that you can fly, 
Hanuman, of course, is our mind, right? Each Hanuman resides within each one of us. We can fly. We have to have that Vishwas, Atma Vishwas, and we have to do it. I think temples will be the way because I don't see the institutions. They are total under total control of uh, those whose minds are colonized, and you can't decolonize them anytime soon. So rather than worry about them and fight them, we can do it ourselves and we can use different medium media, you know, the, the new media, the internet to connect to the rest of the world and people will come to us. So one of the, one of the words that is abused a lot today is guru. So what is the real meaning of guru? Does it simply mean a teacher? Today, anybody can become a guru. If you, st if you open a yoga academy, you're a guru. If you're in the West and you get a few Western followers, you're a big guru. So what is the real meaning of, of guru in the historical sense? Well, uh, guru is also what... Um, guru is also heavy. You know, the word guru from Guru Tvakarshan, right? Uh, gu well, guru is who opens your eye. I think there's uh, there's another etymology, gu and ru, which uh, who helps you open your eyes or whatever. But you know, it's just a term. Guru is just a term. Um, ultimately, you know, it's like um, a prof two professors of physics. There could be four different professors of physics, and three have superficial knowledge, and maybe only one of the four has really subtle knowledge, and people know it. You know, when you interact with these professors, you know, who knows the stuff and who doesn't know the stuff. So, uh, so I guess people will right now because we don't have a curated system. And maybe having a curated system is a problem because we have too much of curation through government agency, right? Only people who go through their system can become a professor. So we have to sidestep it, step it aside, sweep it aside. And come up with a system where, where in the Zen tradition, when you become a master and they have a protocol for it, you're called a Roshi. And you know what Roshi is? Roshi is the Sanskrit Rishi. They, <sighs> they call it Roshi. So they give the person the name Roshi. So we have to have a system where, uh, they, where within such a self-regulating system, um, people um, are recognized for their knowledge so that people know where they should go and where they should turn. And some of that is happening automatically. For example, on YouTube, uh, we have this um, Ramakrishna Mission Swami, uh, whom I know a little bit, um, very fine uh, speaker, uh, Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji, right? And he's, he speaks on uh, Advaita Vedanta. He does it very well. And there are some other Ramakrishna mission Swaminis who are very, very articulate and wonderful and have very deep knowledge. And so you have you see that a lot of people are watching them. So there is the public also wants to be connected to somebody who's speaking from the heart because you can see you're not looking for superficial, academic, pedantic knowledge. There's somebody who stands up and says, uh, here, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this mantra from the Rig Veda and then intones in, you know, in, in tones in this mechanical voice as to what this means. No, no, we want people speaking from the heart. And that will happen because this knowledge lives on in India. It lives on and it's lived on in our grandmothers, you know, because they are connected to it in a vital way. Um, uh, and it, it's, it survives in India in all corners of the people, in all classes, in the humblest homes, you know, the poorest people, you find them, you talk to them, when you make eye contact, you know that they know. So it, it survives in India. So India, from because of this, is going to show the light. Okay, one last question. Uh, was India born in 1947? Is India a British creation? Which is what lots of people say. Well, this particular incarnation, this particular political arrangement is certainly born in 1947. But just as, you know, the story uh, who believe in uh, Punarijanma, 
that we have many incarnations at the individual level. Uh, India as a political body has had many other incarnations and um, the Vedic books speak about it. You know, they speak about Chakravarti Rajas who rule all corners of the world. World meaning the world as known uh, to them, which is all corners of India. So India has had so many Chakravarti Rajas. And of course, we have the big uh, dynasties, the Cholas, the Pallavas, who ruled for a thousand years. Can you believe it? Which other dynasty in which corner of the world uh, has uh, survived for that long, the Pallavas and the Cholas? And then um, I, the other day, I discovered that even in Uttarakhand, which is where my wife is from, there were these kings, the Panvars, who ruled for 1,200 years, from 600 to 1,800. So we've had kings who have ruled for a long time, and we have not just uh, you know going back into history, um, and not the not just the last millennium. Prior to that, we have uh, we had uh, empires, and not just the Pallavas and the Cholas, but in we had the Satvahans, you had the Rashtrakutas, you had um, you had empires in in Gujarat and. Certainly, the Guptas, the Mauryas, and and so many, and and even prior, which I think still needs to be investigated, uh, the the Vedic era, and which is something that you mentioned earlier on. How do we look at this enormous literature and do something of the kind which has been done, let's say, for the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian king lists, just anchor them to one or two. Uh, astronomical events and which suddenly gives them life. I think that needs to be done. Um, in addition to um, this um, era of 3102, for, for which we don't have the same, uh, which, is, which is connected to Aryabhat uh, 500 CE, but how do, we, how do we justify it? And for that, um, um, I believe you are doing a project. I'm very pleased. And that'll be a wonderful thing. And I think that would be a very important um, challenge for us um, as a people to understand our past. So one of the uh, arguments that people put forth is that India was just a collection of kingdoms and it was unified once or twice over the past two, two and a half thousand years. So one of the counter arguments I would give is that take uh, Vishnu Gupta Chandakya, for example. He was born in Patliputra, I believe, or in that region in the kingdom of Magadh. And he was a professor in Takshashila, which is to the far west of India. So how does a guy who was born in Magadh become a professor in Patliputra, which is uh, in uh, Takshashila, which is a completely different kingdom? So it would happen only if it was a single unified country or at least a single civilization. And the people saw each other as the, as, as the same. Would you agree with oh, that? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think anybody can dispute that. You have the Puranas. And this huge documents, you know, unlike what any other civilization has, you have so many Puranas, so huge, and they do talk about this entire region as one. You know, this whole region from the Himalayas to the sea, uh, from one corner to the other, so from the Sindhu to the east, so as a region. But it was also seen, if you go earlier on, before the Puranas, because many of them were finalized only, say, 1,500 years ago, um, because Puranas kept on being written. But certainly, the Vedic books, they also saw beyond the Himalayas, right? The Uttar Kuru. And that's a very important element that we have not paid as much of attention to as we need to. So I think India was unified. And you look at Europe. Europe was also so many different warring states and so much of bloodshed, right? Uh, every few years and wars or battles, wars going on for a hundred years, you know, hundred year war and this and that. So, so, so India also had these Rajas, but they were not shedding blood in the same volume as the Europeans were, uh, because there was much more of rules of engagement, you know, even when you battle, as we see in Mahabharata, you know, those stories about how uh, at at sunset, you 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 were to put your um, shastras down and wait until the next morning, and protect women and children and this and that. 
so uh, so I, I I totally agree with you. India has been a unified uh, region, and um, and even uh, Greater India. I, I think we should also not forget Greater India, which encompassed all of Southeast Asia and certainly North Central Asia as well. And I, but I also say that now we look, we are living in the global village, or we should look at all of the world as this greater India, and and Indian wisdom is for everybody. That's what I truly, truly believe in. Thank you, Dr. Kark. It was wonderful talking to you. So, I'll stop the discussion. I'll stop the recording now. Thank you, Abhijit. Really enjoyed it. That was wonderful.